the people who rated themselves and their partners as putting in more effort found treatment to be more effective. They also tended to have higher relationship and sexual satisfaction. And they rated ADHD as being less of a barrier to a good sex life. So my catchy little phrase from this is that managing ADHD is an aphrodisiac. Working on it and putting in that effort pays off in lots of ways, including in the bedroom. ADHD Rewired, episode 94. This is the show designed to help those of us who have really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and consultant. We know that starting can be the hardest part, so let's get started. But first, let me thank our sponsors. Support for this podcast comes from Audible. For a free audiobook download, go to ericktivers.com slash audible for a link for that free download and for some hand-picked recommendations. Go to ericktivers.com slash audible for your free audiobook download. Give yourself the gift of ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group. Start your 2016 off with a bang. Early registration is underway now. Go to coachingrewired.com to schedule your free 20-minute consultation with me. That's coachingrewired.com. Again, coachingrewired.com. And prepare to get your ADHD rewired. Hey there, ADHD Rewired listeners. It's December 15th, 2015. There is less than one week until the webinar event of the year. Why is it the event of the year? Because it's a lot more appealing than saying it's just going to be a pretty good webinar. It's high tech and low tech strategies to supercharge your productivity. I do believe that this productivity webinar is going to be like any other productivity webinar you've ever attended. I'm going to talk about strategy. I'm going to talk about shame and courage and failure. I'm going to feature a number of my favorite high-tech and low-tech tools, and I'm going to go deep into some of them, including Evernote, uh, some Gmail plugins that I seriously don't know what I would do without them. I'm also going to show you my new favorite software that is truly changing the way I do email, Facebook, scheduling, and I keep finding new uses for it. I'm also going to be offering an early registration bonus incentive for the upcoming ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group. I can't mention the details about it here because then I'll be telling you all of my secrets, but you can find out if you come to the webinar. It's scheduled for Monday, December 21st at 1 p.m. Central. That's 11 a.m. if you're on the West Coast and 2 p.m. if you're on the East Coast. The webinar is completely free, but there are only 48 spots left. You can register at ADHDrewired.com or check out the ADHD Rewired Facebook page. There's information there. I'll see you there. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. We are doing this live for another Blab, and I am joined back for the third time on ADHD Rewired, my friend Ari Tuckman. Hey, Ari, how are you? I'm good. I'm, I'm glad to be here for the trifecta. You try, like, there are only a few people, I think, who have actually met, got into that, that very small, select group. So congratulations. I feel so special. I will, uh, you, you have won uh, my voice on your home answering machine. <laughs> <laughs> so we had you back. Uh, we, well, we had, last time we had you on was uh, episode uh, 55, where we were, th you were in the midst of collecting data on sex and intimacy in the realm of, of ADHD. And I had said to you that when, once you get the results for that, we got to have you back on to, to talk about 
what you discovered. And when I when yeah. uh, I saw you at the conference, um, I was asking you about it, and you said it was awesome because there were so many results that that were sort of um, unexpected. Which is when you're doing research, I mean, that's always fun to get the the unexpected uh, results. Um, so let's just jump right in and uh, just share some of the the unexpected results that you found, and and uh, tell us about the research. Sure. So, well, let me actually provide some context before we jump in. So, you know, a little foreplay as, Ar- as Ari's, it were. Yeah, Ari's not, doesn't have ADHD. Um, right. So uh, thanks, Ari. <laughs> Slow, slowing things down for us here. Right. <laughs> so, um, so the relationship or the research here was I did an online survey looking at what I'm calling mixed couples. So couples where one person has ADHD and one person doesn't, and they could be dating, they could be married, they could be whatever. Um, so, uh, it was this gigantic survey that in hindsight, I think was either kind of overly optimistic or delusional, but, um, There were 47 questions, but when you add in the sub questions, it actually winds up being 72 questions. So what in the hell was I doing? Ask having people fill out 72 questions, but they did it. And I got almost 3000 people who filled it out all the way to the end. Wow! I think that, which is awesome. I know that you Um, were hoping for like 400. And when I had you um, back on episode 55, you had like 1500 at that point and you were kind of just like blown away by it. So you had 3000. Wow. Yeah. And it's actually, it's still up. So if you go to ADHD relationship, sex survey.com, you can still fill it out. But, um, but I think what it says is that people are really interested in this topic. You know, it's really important. You know, your sex life is a really important part of your life as a couple. So, um, so I think it's a great topic and people are interested in it, but, uh, what was, so one of the most surprising negative results was that ADHD medication, stimulant medication, most people really don't find it helpful in terms of sexual experiences, which is amazing. And I think it's like, I'm, this is one of those things where if I was going to bet money on the results of, of any of the questions, like I seriously, I would have bet $500 $500 on this one. And I'm not like a betting person, but like, I totally would have bet money on, well, of course, you know, people with ADHD get distracted and medication, stimulating medication helps with distractibility. We all get distracted at least sometimes during sex. Wouldn't medication then be helpful? So that was always like one of the first bits of advice that we would give, you know, when I was presenting on it or clients in my office, it was really obvious advice to give that can't possibly be wrong. And it was totally wrong. Like how like, much so? Like give us some, some uh, the, the depth of what the research said, what the data said. Sure. So um, first of all, 35% of the people who um, answered the question said that, that that stimulating medication was not active during the time that they're having sex. So that means either that they're not taking meds at all, which is one possibility, I'm sure is true for some of them. Or for others, if, you know, if you take your medication in the morning, it's really worn off by the nighttime, so you can sleep. Um, And if you have young kids at home, you're probably not having a lot of sex during the day. So therefore, you know, it's just by coincidence and circumstance, you're in a situation where the meds ain't doing their thing. So, um, but of the people then, so 35%, let's just put them aside, but the other 65% of that, 45% of them really found that it just, it doesn't do much of anything. It's not good. It's not bad. It doesn't help. doesn't hurt. It just doesn't do anything. Like it has no effect on the sexual experience, which was amazing to me. Um, when you look then at the rest of the responses, so there were, I guess, seven possible responses. So makes it a lot worse, makes it somewhat worse, makes it a little bit worse, has no effect, a little bit better, somewhat better, a lot better. Each of those other responses, you wanted with like three to 5% of folks endorsing each of those others, but it's totally evenly spread wow. out. So what it tells you is there really is no effect to medication. And like, I have to admit, like, I'm actually kind of really psyched that we were completely wrong about that because like, this is why you do research. Right. If all it does is show what to you ch- know, to challenge our theories. Yeah. Then why did you bother? Right. So that was amazing to me 
the results of that one. Um, so obviously that's, that's not a bit of advice I'm giving anymore. Okay. So um, the medication does not help sex. Right. Right. It helps you maybe load the dishwasher and not interrupt your partner. So you're more likely to get sex, but it doesn't actually help you during the sexual process. Um, so that was one thing that was, I think, really interesting. Now, there are a couple other findings as well that, again, like I would have bet money on. And fortunately, I didn't because I would have lost my money. Um, so, you know, folks with ADHD, they get bored with the same old thing mm -hmm. and they prefer variety and novelty and all of that. So I had a couple of questions in there, you know, looking at this. One of them was, to what extent do you... Um, prefer having a larger repertoire of sexual activities versus a smaller repertoire of sexual activities. You know, so do you like having kind of a big range to choose from mm -hmm. or a smaller range? And I'm happy. So my guess um, would be larger range. What did what the right. research show? Right. And that's what I would have guessed as well. Nope. What? No more. Yeah. No more so than the non ADHD folks. So the ADHD folks and the non ADHD had the same, huh. design, you know, so. So, of course, in the survey, it really um, what I'm comparing is ADHD folks versus non-ADHD folks. So that's kind of one comparison. But then, of course, I'm also looking at gender because, like, for example, if I if one of the questions I looked at is frequency of porn use and I could maybe I find, you know, like folks with ADHD look at more porn than folks without ADHD. Well, OK, but maybe that's just a gender thing because guys look at a lot more porn than women do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got to look at gender, too. But but yeah, in terms of this variety thing, not at all. Folks mm -hmm. with ADHD have no greater desire for a larger repertoire, more variety than folks without ADHD. Did, did your survey look at the um, the like how much time is spent on on, on pornography or pornography addiction? You know what? I didn't look at that. I had a few questions in there related to it, but so we'll, we'll get to that, but okay. that was one of those that fell into what we expected. So the third surprising finding here is related to the second one, which is the desire for novelty, kind of experimenting with new sexual experiences versus staying with the familiar. And again, I would have bet money that folks with ADHD want more novelty. Because, you know, they want often more novelty in other things. Right. So, nope, no more than than the non-ADHD folks. What, what do you think explains that? I mean, that seems totally counterintuitive to what I would think. I know. I know. Um, I don't know. I guess I don't know if it's that people if they're if they're kind of happy with the sex that they're getting you know like maybe that's it like the the range of options is going well and you know their partners are kind of willing to be accommodating or something i don't know um it's a good question now of course it, the other possibility here is this is all kind of self-report so someone who i don't know has a range of three things that they could do during sex might feel like, you know, that's, that's a pretty big range. And someone else might have 30 things that they could do during sex. And, you know, that's not big enough. So, you know, so it's all kind of like mm -hmm. self perception. Um, so there is that possibility. But, but you know what, in relationships, it's all about self perception anyway, mm -hmm. you know, like, if I feel like you're not carrying your weight, it doesn't matter if the reality is that you're working twice as hard as I am, if my perception is that I'm doing more than you. So, um, so kind of like this, or at least it doesn't matter in the sense that the self perception is where we need to start the discussion. Hmm. Um, now, uh, since you started the research, you've been um, going, you've been getting, uh, going through your own like, training in um, you're seeking out another certification. What, what, tell, tell me what, again, what you, I forgot what you said about that. Sure. So, yeah. So, you know, I became really interested. I mean, I've been interested in kind of the topic of sex for a long time. And I don't mean just like since, since I was a teenager, like, yeah, since, since like, 12. Right, since <laughs> like 12, 13, I've been very interested. Um, but you know, I've been really interested in it specifically in terms of my clinical work. And, you know, the whole theory here is that, Couples where one person has ADHD will tend to struggle a little bit more than folks where nobody has ADHD. Now, obviously, every couple has their struggles, and some of them are very common, 
and typical and some are unique to the specific people. But, um, you know, if you're struggling enough during the day, just getting your regular stuff done, you don't need one more thing to struggle with, as in struggling at night. And the hope is that having good sexual experiences helps the couple kind of reconnect, feel good about each other, have positive experiences, not just like getting through the daily grind mm -hmm. of life and then passing out at the end. Um, you know, that, that good connection. Getting beyond survival. Exactly, exactly. Um, so that good connection fuels then more positive experiences all the rest of the time. You know, that, and it's not, and it, and that it works both ways that, you know, good sex requires good behavior, but also good and good behavior leads to better, better sex. So um, by having these good experiences together makes it more likely that these couples, um, you know, that hoping to have sex tonight makes everyone hopefully behave a little bit better today, but also having good sex tonight puts us all in a better mood to behave well tomorrow. And it just spills forward, spills forward. So that's kind of the rationale for this topic in general and, you know, the survey as well. So in the interest of becoming more knowledgeable about this, I'm actually doing a sex therapy certification program. So, you know, I've been in practice since, I don't know, like 18 years or something. I've been in practice and there's always more to learn. Mm -hmm. And this is an area that, you know, I'm not as familiar in as I would like to be. And, uh, you know, so I'm getting more training in it. Um, one of the things that I remember we talked about back on episode 55 um, was you were kind of theorizing that if uh, couples don't go to bed together, that there would be less sex. Um, what did the research, uh, what did the data show? Right. So, yeah, you know what? That was another one. That was one of the questions I asked. And although some people did endorse that as a barrier to having a more active sex life, you know, kind of most people didn't, um, it, or at least it didn't rise to the top as being, you know, one of the major barriers. So, you know, so again, that's something, you know, I'm going to change my recommendations, although certainly getting into bed on time is still a good idea, um, partly because if you get into bed with your partner, you're more likely to actually get a decent night's sleep. But also that I think if you're physically present in bed together, it's more likely that something's going to lead to something. Mm, mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it and at one level, it makes sense. And, uh, you know, our, as, as you know, and I've shared on, on the podcast before, you know, my, my wife and I, uh, we sleep in separate bedrooms. Um, and at first, I hated the idea. I was like, what does it mean? And we've talked about this whole idea of, well, it all depends on how you think about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I know that, that Tom and his wife do the same thing, Tom Nardone. Um, and we did a whole episode about sleeping in separate bedrooms. And so, you know, I just... I just wonder, and I still have this idea that, you know, if, if sleep is so important for our health and if sleeping mm -hmm. in the same room with a partner is going to impact negatively your, your sleep, are you going to be more irritable? And is that irritability going to lead to less sex? So it's just, mm -hmm. it, it, it's interesting. And I think that, that yeah. a lot of the assumed behaviors that, that uh, couples have, um, you know, it's, it's just interesting to see what the research actually says. Well, and I think that this idea of sleeping in different bedrooms, it's a great solution. Like, and it's, it's an awesome example of being flexible because, of course, the ideal is that we all, you know, that both people sleep in the same bed and they go to bed at the same time. They wake up at the same time and nobody snores and nobody rolls around and kicks and wakes the other person up. And, you know, like and, and if that's all true, then that's awesome. But if it isn't true, then you have a choice to make, not among the options you wish you had, but among the options you actually have. So I think it's far better to sleep in separate bedrooms. Everybody gets a good night's sleep and therefore everybody cognitively performs better and is a lot more fun to be around compared to forcing sleeping in the same room where it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, and my wife will tell you even more, like I am not fun to be around when I have not had enough sleep. So if that was an issue, like I would sleep in another bedroom, you know, like if her, her whatever was disrupting my sleep, then I would make that choice because it really is the better one. So I think that the, the broader lesson here, especially for couples where someone has ADHD, but really for every couple is 
don't be limited by the obvious, this is how it should be. And instead, do what works. And if that is the best of the available options, then choose it and be flexible and don't overread it. Oh, maybe it's because we don't love each other. Maybe that's why we don't sleep in the same room. No, that has nothing to do with it. Let's not make it about love. Let's just make it about sleep. Mm -hmm. So, which maybe then brings us to porn, because I think that, um, all you know, conversations coming on back lead to porn, to porn. right, right. All, all sex conversations lead to porn. So, um, so one of the things I looked at in the survey was porn use because, you know, like we're joking, you know, it's hard to talk about sex these days without also talking about porn. Um, so, <clears throat> okay. So I looked at, um, I asked people about their porn use. So I asked about, I asked three questions about porn. One is how frequently do you look at porn? Now I didn't ask for how long at a time, but just in general, how often do you look at porn? And that could be alone or it could be with your partner. It could be to orgasm or it could be without. So I asked it most broadly. Um, then I asked, how do you feel about your porn use? And then I asked, how do you feel about your partner's porn use? Um, and what was in, you know, there's a number of interesting things that came out of this analysis. So what I could do is I could take people's answers to any question, but, you know, let's say one of these questions and I could compare it to their answers to lots of other questions. So, you know, that's how we kind of did the analysis. So um, what I found was that a number of things, men look at a lot more porn than women. Okay, fine, that's not uncommon. But the thing is, some women were, you know, like there were indeed women who were also looking at porn. It wasn't just the guys. Do you um, recall the numbers? I don't off the top of my head. Um, I mean, the women were not on average looking at it nearly as much as the guys were. The guys were looking way more than mm -hmm. the women were. But it wasn't zero. And there were certainly some women who were looking at porn quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, you know, according to other sources, you know, that number is changing more and more. There are more and more women looking at adult content online. That is not just the men. Um, and my guess is that probably generationally, you know, like the younger folks, that's, a, you know, the there's many more women and the younger folks looking at porn compared to like older folks. But, you know, well, right, let, so, let me ask you this, because I know that sometimes I hear, um, you know, that people who are talking about sex and relationships uh, say that, you know, porn never leads to anything good. It's, you know, whenever you, there's infidelity, mm -hmm. um, it always begins with porn. Um, what what are you what are you finding in the research? Yeah, well, and that's a perfect lead in because, you know, there is all this stuff out there about, you know, the, the destructive effect of porn and how it's always a bad thing and all this stuff. And I'll start out by saying there are absolutely people in this world who use porn in very problematic and excessive ways. And it does cause problems in the relationship or they're very insensitive to their partner about their porn use or whatever. So I'm not. I'm not justifying or minimizing any of that. But overall, most, you know, when you look at the overall average of averaging out all 3,000 people who did the survey, overall, porn use was not really that big of a problem in the sense that most people didn't feel, most people felt at least okay or slightly above zero, slightly above neutral about their own porn use and only a little bit negative about their partner's porn use. So it's overall on average, it's not this big, terrible thing that's destroying relationships the way some people might lead you to believe. But what was also interesting is that it's easy to say that, you know, well, the only people who look at porn are people in unhappy relationships. And also, by the way, the relationship is unhappy because they're looking at porn. But what I found was that actually people who are very happy in the relationship and very happy sexually also look at, at the same amount of porn as the people who are very unhappy. So, you know, and I think the reason is if you're happy in, in your relationship, if you're comfortable in the relationship, it's easier to look at porn if you feel like it without anybody kind of getting insecure or upset about it. Um, and I think, for the people who are unhappy in the relationship, you know, on the one hand, if porn or more generally masturbation is a way to kind of 
relieve some of that pressure of like, I'm not doing anything with my partner. So at least I'm taking care of my own needs. On the one hand, that can be very good if it reduces fights, you know, like instead of pursuing your uninterested partner, if you take care of your own needs, and that's probably a positive. On the other hand, if porn is the easy out, like I'm going to go, you know, jerk off and look at porn and not have to, rather than go be nice to my wife and address those things that she's upset about, like if that's the method, then that's not going to be helpful and it's not going to make the relationship better. And by the same token, saying porn is the devil and that's why we have all these problems, it's not about the fact that we're always fighting, it's not about the fact that I'm out in your case and that I'm um, sort of judgmental about what you're interested in sexually or otherwise. It is. It's an easy scapegoat. So porn is, is it's all of these things and it's, and it's none of these things. So I think that one, one individual's relationship to porn and the, how porn fits into the couple relationship needs like that's a person by person, couple by couple kind of thing. And, you know, my advice is if you're happy in, re- in your relationship, if you're happy overall in your sex life, um, if your partner looks at porn, if it's not a thing, don't make it a thing. Unless they're looking at something that kind of morally you're kind of like, eh, I'm OK with some stuff, but like I cannot like I don't really like that kind of porn. So mm-hmm. Um, you know, just in the same way that some people may say like, look, factory raised veal, like I can't, I cannot get behind, morally, I can't get behind mm-hmm. that. So you can eat other meat, but just not that. Like, I think that's a valid request. Like we can make requests of each other. We can negotiate against those requests, but you know, so, um, but as long as there's some negotiation and compromise and mutual understanding, then if it ain't a thing, don't make it a thing. Are you planning on writing about this? I am. I am. So I've done some presenting on it. Mm -hmm. And like at the Chad conference this year, I did a three hour pre-con on this. But yeah, definitely. I'm going to take this, um, you know, the results of the survey is basically going to be the foundation for a book that I'd like to write for couples with ADHD, where one person has ADHD to kind of improve their sex life and improve their relationship. Okay, um, and uh, we're going to take a quick break in just a moment. When we do come back from the break, uh, I'm going to open up uh, the seat if you guys have questions. Uh, for those of you who are joining us live in the Blab, uh, this is going to be a great opportunity for you to ask those questions. You can get some FaceTime with, uh, with Ari, and um, we will be back in just a moment. If you hate shopping as much as I do, and you love shopping on Amazon as much as I do, support this podcast by doing all your holiday shopping on Amazon, but start at ADHDrewired.com. There's an Amazon search portal there that's on the right side of the page, just a little bit down the way. Go there, it'll get to the same Amazon you were used to, and a small percentage of your purchase will go to support this podcast. Do your shopping on Amazon, but start at ADHDrewired.com. Thank you so much. Go to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired for your free audiobook download. With Hanukkah and Christmas just around the corner, New Year's resolutions will be set. Give yourself the gift of ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group. We start at the end of January. If you are interested, early registration has started. Schedule a call with me. Go to coachingrewired.com. Again, that is coaching rewired.com and schedule your free 20 minute consultation and screening call with me today. Again, that's coaching rewired.com and prepare to get your ADHD rewired. Before we get back to today's interview, let's check in once again with Ryan McRae, the ADHD nerd. Hey, this is Ryan, the ADHD nerd. Whew, this episode's a little steamy. 
when it comes to sex and intimacy, my best tip, well, it's just to listen to the rest of this podcast because I got nothing in that field, but I'm working on it. I'm working on it. So I'm taking some detailed notes, my fellow nerds. And for non-sex tips around ADHD, check out my site, the ADHDnerd.com, and it is Eric Tivers approved. Woo! Later, nerds, and listen up. That was Ryan McRae from the ADHDnerd.com. Ryan, you're such a nerd. So, okay, let's uh, let's get back into uh, what were there any other uh, surprising <clears throat> results uh, from the survey, or were there things that were just very inconclusive? Um, cause I'm, cause for me, when I'm researching things, I usually end up with more questions than I have answers for. Did, right. did you find that? Well, so here was something. Um, so when you look overall at how often people had sex, um, you know, out of the 3,000 people, the average was like 1.2 times per week. And, you know, that's actually pretty much in line with national averages. Mm -hmm. So obviously some people were having sex once a day or more, and some people hadn't had sex in six months. So like that average doesn't quite, as one number, it doesn't really tell the story. But if you looked at, I then also asked, how often would you like to have sex? Um, and I don't remember if I said with your partner, because um, <laughs> of course that's kind of an important specifier, but, um, but the average was like three point something times per week. So this I think is really important because I think what it says is that people across the board would like more sex than they're getting. So there's a tremendous opportunity here. Um, and, you know, the sort of like my big takeaway from this is imagine how much happier these couples would be if they all had sex three times more often. Hmm. So, Not that it's as simple as just jumping into bed more is going to make everything else in the relationship better. But, you know, it does have a positive effect. And there is indeed a relationship, a correlation between relationship satisfaction and sexual satisfaction. And that improving your your the frequency and quality of your sex life is going to have a positive spillover effect. I mean, it's not magic. I mean, you got to do the work to actually make it more frequent. You got to do the work to make it more enjoyable for both people. Um, but I think it's really it's it's an it's a very um, heartening finding as far as I'm concerned. Huh? Yeah, it's um, there's a lot there to to kind of dissect what so tell me some of the things you now you said that um you know you used to tell people uh because it seemed like common sense to take medication uh for sex because but the data showed that it actually has no impact uh, on mm -hmm. it what are some of the from my to a, for a, from a clinical perspective uh have there been any other kind of uh changes that you have made as a result of uh, what your data has shown well you know for the Apart from some of these other surprising negative findings, you know, what the findings did was they, they backed up the rest of what we were saying. So rather than just saying, this seems obvious to me that this would be true. So here, try this thing. You know, what we can do is say, well, the couples who are the most satisfied in their relationship and are most satisfied with their sex life tend to do more of this relative to those who are least satisfied, you know, so it's not just making things up or not just, you know, good, hopefully clinical judgment, but it's actually numbers here. So, you know, one of the things that came out and this will not at all be surprising is that um, all the sort of information related to effort that got put in to managing ADHD, whether it's your ADHD or your partner's ADHD. So, People who put in more effort also tended to rate their partners as putting in more effort. Makes you know, which sense. makes sense. I mean, you know, social um, reciprocity. I mean, that's sure. So, um, and of course, when there isn't reciprocity, then we downregulate. And if we don't feel like the other person's putting in as much, then we might put in less. So, you know, there's a relationship between those two. But the people who rated, um, 
themselves and their partners as putting in more effort found treatment to be more effective, not surprising. They also tended to have higher relationship and sexual satisfaction. And they rated ADHD as being less of a barrier to a good sex life. So, um, you know, or kind of the my catchy little phrase from this is that managing ADHD is an aphrodisiac. You know, that working on it and putting in that effort pays off in lots of ways, including in the bedroom. Um, now, what was also interesting was um, that I asked people to rate how hard, how much effort are they themselves putting in and how much effort do they think their partner is putting in? And like I said, there are correlations here, but what was amazing across the board is how people rated their own effort so much higher than their partner's effort. Mm. And of course, this is not surprising because of course it's like, well, I know everything I'm doing, but I only see some of what you're right. doing. So I don't think you're actually doing that much when I'm not looking. Um, so I think that the fact that this is such a universal thing, I think tells us a number of things. One of them is don't believe your eyes. <clears throat> you know, assume, don't assume that if you didn't see it happening, it didn't actually happen. <clears throat> you know, because there's a lot of times when your partner is doing some things that you didn't happen to notice, or they're doing something that maybe isn't top of your list, but it might be top of their list. So you know, with, with, it's funny, my uh, with with uh, Sarah, my, my wife and I, um, we give each other permission to just like say, hey, I, I empty the dishwasher, like, because we like to right. say, you know, it, it feels good to get thanked for something. And if you don't see, you know, the a person do it, like, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. So it's, we have the, yeah. we have the right to say, hey, look what I did. <laughs> right. And I think, and that's exactly what I'm talking about, because mm -hmm. otherwise, you know, you go to throw something in the dishwasher and it's mostly empty. Like there's a couple things in there, but you won't necessarily pause and think like, let's see, the last time I looked in the dishwasher, was it full or empty? I don't, you know, so if you don't pause to consider it, then you don't realize like, oh, wait a second. Like an hour ago, this thing was like jam packed full of clean dishes. And now it's mostly empty. Ah, somebody around here. I want, you know, process of elimination. It's a rather, poor mystery novel to figure out who that might be. Um, somebody around here emptied it. So, so yeah, some, so, you know, part of my advice is exactly what you're saying is to make it known without feeling like you're, you know, reporting in, yes, sir, reporting in for duty that you're reporting it without feeling like you're reporting in, but letting the other person know so you can get credit for what you're actually doing. But it's also a matter of looking actively looking for like, oh, how about that? Ishwasher is empty. I don't think I did it. So must have been that other person I live with. Hey, honey, I, uh, I picked up my underwear from the floor three days in a row. What do you think right. about that? Huh? <laughs> 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 Getting it so funny, dude, because my, my wife will, I mean, she, she, she picks up my underwear pretty often in socks and, you know, which is, I think it's a very, I don't think it's an ADHD thing. I think that's just like sort of a semi-universal just, you know, husband and wives, you know, it's like we don't realize the trail that we leave. And, you know, it's so my, my wife occasionally tells me she doesn't do it to badger me. Um, and we kind of joke about it. And I always, I always thank her for it. And when she does tell me, I always thank her. And then for at least a few days, I make an effort to try to pick it up. Uh, I mean, it's just like magic. It, it follows me like a trail. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> so right. um we have a couple we have a question um and i know you kind of answered this but just maybe give a quick response to it mm -hmm. uh, from our cara says uh how does this uh, sex intimacy correlate to adhd versus quote regular folks right yeah so <clears throat> you know in the survey i kind of used and this isn't really true, but I sort of use the non-ADHD partners as the control group for the ADHD partners. Um, now, it's not really true because um, someone who marries somebody with ADHD is not necessarily a random sampling of the population. Right, right. You know, so I didn't put the survey out and say anybody in the world who wants to answer it, because I really, I don't have any way of getting non ADHD mm -hmm. people to fill this out in sufficient numbers to be able to do a real statistical analysis. So, but 
But you know what? Maybe that's fine because if you have ADHD and you're married to someone without ADHD, it doesn't matter what the hell everybody else is doing. And if you don't have ADHD, but you're married to someone who does have ADHD, again, it doesn't matter what the hell all those other people are doing. Like you only care about what's going on between you and your partner. Right. So, um, so, you know, I feel okay about doing that comparison. So, you know, in this discussion here, whenever I say, you know, ADHD, I'm always comparing it to their non ADHD partners. Yeah. So th thanks for that response. Um, you know, and so how would you describe this research? I mean, cause I, I wouldn't say this is empirical research. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, um, you know, so from an academic standpoint, um, when we compare it to like the research of like, you know, Barkley and his colleagues and, and this, I mean, it's just, a it's a different league of research. Um, it's, a, right. it's, it's starting a discussion, uh, the way I, I kind of look at it. Um, what's been the response to, uh, to maybe some of your other even just academic colleagues, if, if you've been, if you've had any response, uh, from that. Right. You know, overall the interest, the response has been very positive. Like people are very interested in this. So, you know, every type of research has its strengths and weaknesses. And obviously the gold standard in research is double blind placebo controlled. Um, except, you know, in this case, it, this, you know, I'm not testing an intervention, you know, does telling couples to do something or other, like, does that make things mm -hmm. better or worse? Really, it's more, it's, you know, it's a survey. So it's more descriptive in terms of like, you know, what is this, this state of this? Now, obviously, the people who took my survey are not necessarily representative of every person in the United States. Mm -hmm. So, but I think what they are is representative of the kinds of people who get information about ADHD in various online formats, who attend conferences and webinars, listen to podcasts, things like that. So in other words, the people who will tend to be listening to what I am saying about this and what you are saying about it, they are the people that this data is based on. So I'm not going to claim it applies to everybody in the world, but you know, there was a very wide range of ages, of duration of relationship, of kids or no kids, of, you know, all of that stuff. So, um, and there's another question here too, uh, about the, the study subjective and focus, and that was really mm -hmm. peer review. Right. So, um, the objective and focus was really just to figure out, you know, to get some information on the relationship um, in sex lives of couples where one person has ADHD and one person does not, um, and really kind of comparing ADHD versus non-ADHD, comparing, um, you know, looking at gender, you know, to see like, did that make a difference? Um, now when you say also, gender, you mean like sex, like or, or gender, gender meaning male or female? Okay, so, so I, I would definitely define it as sex because gender is a more of that that right. kind of defined. Because um, I, you know, I I know members in the community who I, I can hear it. I can just hear them. Like, right. That, that's, he's not using the right word. You know, it's so right. And and I am absolutely, I'm totally like pro all that stuff. Um, but for the sake of a survey, you need to simplify it down. I did have a bunch of gay couples. I did have a bunch of lesbian couples fill out the survey as well. Um, what did that data show? You know, the problem was I didn't have enough, enough of them. To make meaning so, of it. Okay. so it's hard to do any really big analysis. So mm -hmm. it's really a bunch of straight folks, unfortunately. <laughs> but, you know, like a lot of research, you start with the biggest, most obvious groups, and then you kind of narrow it down from there. So, um, but, you know, I think despite the fact that there are some limitations in terms of the data, because, you know, we're only limited to the people who found the survey and took it to the end, um, it's all self-perception. So people could be lying or deluding themselves. That's another possibility. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's some very clear patterns in that data. And I actually like, <clears throat> you know, one of the things I did just this random statistical test, like I did a t-test on the difference in porn viewing of ADHD versus non-ADHD. It just picked some one random thing. And the thing about it is when you have 3,000 respondents, you can find statistical significance in everything, you know, because it's just with big numbers, everything is statistically significant. Mm -hmm. But um, so like in that case, it was significant to 10 to the 27th. 
Okay, so uh, that that was just sounding so nerdy. Can you break right. that down? Um, you know, so, or I think if anyone can break down uh, a t test and data analysis to its simplest form, it is you. Oh, uh, it's here. It, it, it's not me. <laughs> it is. It isn't actually me, but I'll give my best shot at it. So, um, basically, what it means is that it's incredibly unlikely that this was just random chance that we wound up with different responses to this question. But, you know, in terms of the analysis, um, you know, like I said, there's a ton of stuff that we could find statistically significant. I sort of, my focus was really on what was I call it clinically significant. Mm -hmm. So if people with ADHD are 3% more likely than people without ADHD to something, like seriously, I don't care about three percent. Like that is not a useful thing to know. I don't. I wouldn't use that in my office. I can't make recommendations based on three percent. Um, but if there are big differences, if it's like a twenty percent difference or a forty percent or fifty, like now, now we're talking like that. That we could really do something with. So, um, so there's a lot of stuff that I just sort of ignored because it wasn't significant enough. And mm. even there, there was still a ton. I, I mean, like I said, Chad was three hours and that wasn't even everything I could have said. What, what have been some of the questions that you've been uh, getting from people that you've been presenting to? Um, you know, I've gotten a lot of different questions. Um, and I've also gotten a lot of people not asking questions because I think they're sort of, <laughs> and I'm, you know. It's inter- I'm, I'm really glad you pointed that out because for an ADHD conversation, you know, the chat on the side has been remarkably quiet. I know. I know. Maybe it's because people have their real names on some of their Twitter <laughs> accounts or something. So um, note to self, allow aliases. Um, so, yeah, I think that, you know, one of the things that was really, really clear is that the, the couples who were happy tended to be happy in a lot of ways. And the couples who were not happy tended to be not happy in a lot of ways, you know, and there really was very, there really were very different responses. And, you know, I think that what it means is that um, if you're struggling as much as it can feel like there's a lot of places where things are not good, I think it also means there's a lot of places that, um, a lot of points of intervention, a lot of places that you can try to make things better. And I'm definitely, definitely not going to be simplistic enough to say, well, just have more sex and everything's going to be good, because obviously that is not how this all works. But, you know, if the desire for more sex, if, if that's a motivator in some way to improve things in other ways in the relationship, you know what, I will take all the motivators I can get. And as a therapist sitting in my office with certain couples, believe me, I am looking for every motivator I can put my hands on to try to get people to sort of do some things differently. So, you know, if people want to have three times as much sex as they're actually having, that's potentially a really good motivator. So let's use it for good. Let's use it in a positive way to help these couples do better. And, you know, part of that does come down to that boring everyday stuff, you know, or as I say, loading the dishwasher is an aphrodisiac. Now, are you saying as a motivator to, uh, to kind of set up a reward system with, uh, one person in the, the, the relationship empties the dishwasher three nights in a row, um, then they get sex. I don't know that I'd go <laughs> quite, I don't know that they go to a star chart for this. But I, you know what? I mean, hell, if it works, I, I'm not opposed to it. Okay. But, you know, but I don't think it should. I don't know. Like, I don't think it should be too quid pro quo because that feels a little too, a little too something. Mm-hmm. Um, but just in general, to kind of recognize that there is a connection here between what I do with this and what happens over there. Um, and that, you know, for a lot of you know, one of the biggest one of um, barriers to sex was anger. Mm. Either I'm angry at my partner or my partner is angry at me. Um, and also busyness and being too tired. Those are really kind of like the big three, which, you know, kind of we could we could guess those. So 
<clears throat> but I think that they're all connected. You know, people are, they're busy and they're tired because they're busy. They're angry because they feel like their partner isn't being sufficiently supportive or helpful. Um, so they feel more busy and tired. <clears throat> and all of those busy, tired, angry are all libido killers. Um, so what do you do? Well, I think it's a matter of, it's, doing all that day-to-day -day stuff that everybody is in the world of ADHD is talking about um, in the sense of like just managing things better, being more on top of stuff, um, finding more efficient ways to get things done. If your current treatment providers aren't quite effective enough, then work with them until you find someone who is or, you know, change if you have to. But part of it also is that, you know, we all have this idea that when it comes to sex, like a lot of other things, that <clears throat> that desire precedes activity. You know, one if I want, want right? I'm I want I feel kind of horny or I feel like you know fooling around. So now let's go ahead and do that. And obviously that's true, and that is how it works when that's how it works. But it can also go the other way, and this is a little bit more true for women than it is for men. So there is a, uh, a I wasn't going to say a gender split, a sex split on this, um, but you're a good student, Harry. <laughs> I am. I learned. So, um, but the thing is, you know, often starting to fool around a little bit kind of puts us in the mood in a way that we weren't beforehand. So, you know, kind of that idea of having scheduled times for sex. And I, you know, not that it should be like every third Tuesday and, you know, once a month on Fridays or something, but, you know, but having some sort of a schedule or some sort of a like, you know, at eight in the morning, hey, honey, what do you think about tonight? You know, um, having something, have that anticipation, having something to look forward to, a little bit of dirty texting is always fun. Um, as long as you don't have a company cell phone, that's kind of weird. Um, it's a good caveat. Yeah. 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 Don't, you know, keep that in mind if your boss is, you know, getting your text messages. Um, but, you know, it also then kind of pushes you then when it's like, you know, 930 at night and you're like, oh, I'm really sort of tired. I'm not really feeling it right now to do it anyway. And obviously not in a coercive way, not in a I'm going to feel bad about this afterwards way. Not at all. But in a I actually you know what? Now that we're doing this, I'm really enjoying it. This is good. And then afterwards, like, man, that was why don't we do that more often? You know, I know I didn't really feel it before, but like, wow, that was yeah, we need to do this more. Well, we know so, how state based people with ADHD can be. So it's right. like you're tired and you just feel like vegging, staring at a screen, going about it, whatever. But then once you're in it, then you're like, this is great. Yeah, exactly. You know, just like, you know, just like we can sort of plan ahead and schedule lots of other things, including stuff that's a lot less interesting than sex. Like, ugh, I really got to file those papers. So I'm going to do it tonight while I watch TV or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but it's that like having that commitment in that both people are committed. And if at least, and even if one person is less in the mood, if the other one can be good about pushing a little bit of like, come on, let's, you know, I know, but, you know, let's just, let's just see where this goes. Um, then maybe hopefully the other person kind of catches on and gets into the mood a little bit more. But even if they don't, you know, I think there's lots of ways to have a good sexual experience together, even if it isn't, you know, actual full on intercourse. And by the way, a good sex life means a lot more than just intercourse. Don't limit it to just that, mm -hmm. you know, so there are other ways to kind of ensure your partner has a good time, even if you're not really kind of, you know, interested in your own um, or to give your partner permission to go and do their own thing. Like, look, I'm not really feeling it right now, but like, whatever, rain check, you go take care of yourself. That'll be fine. Um, and to just kind of that it, everybody is good about it. The person saying, go take care of yourself is good about it. The person on the receiving end is good about it. So no sulky, pissy, whatever. Because that's a total killer for your odds of having anything next time. Mm -hmm. And there's the shame that I'm sure comes with that as well. Um, right. So we have a, a question. Uh, do you know anything about uh, Richard Blankenship and his work on ADHD and sex? You know what? I don't. Um, so then the, if but, yes, any comment would be irrelevant. <laughs> right. The next but part I will certainly look. I will look him up now that um, now that it's been suggested. 
All right. And then there was an additional comment there about a guy who wanted to have sexuality as a di- as diagnostic in the DSM. Uh, hmm. DSM. I mean, it used to be in it with the DSM three where homosexuality was diagnostic. I mean, so yeah. Um, I'm glad that did not come back into the the DSM. Right. Right. Um. So you know, what do you think then about the idea of of like scheduling sex? You know, there was a great mm-hmm. episode of a uh, Parenthood. Um, where uh, they they coded on their shared calendar, uh, they call it Funky Town, and then nice. uh, and then um, the character Adam Braverman's brother Crosby figured out what Funky Town meant, and it was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what do you think about that? Like, have you have you suggested that to uh, to your clients? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Um, Partly, you know, and I think it's a great idea for two reasons. Um, And then I'll share a couple awesome quotes about it. So the first is anything that's scheduled is much more likely to happen than anything that's not scheduled. You know, and it's that kind of benign neglect. It's not that anyone has the intention of like, you know what, I've decided we're not having sex this week. It's just sort of like you get to Sunday night and you're like, huh, we never actually had sex this week. How'd that happen? You know, so that it just it just kind of doesn't happen. Whereas I think if you schedule it, it's much more likely to happen. Um, And especially if you're otherwise distracted or you're forgetful or you're kind of tired or whatever, it's, it's super easy for it to just kind of like slide off of the schedule and off of the radar. Um, But I think the second reason why it's a good idea is kind of, like I said, it gives that anticipation. There's that buildup about, you know, like, oh, tonight or tomorrow or, you know, so I don't know, maybe you wear some different underwear or you think about like, oh, man, what should we do? Or I'd really like to do this or, you know, you prepare in certain other ways. So it becomes a more, I don't know, like it's just more likely to become a more interesting experience, not just kind of like a quick and done, which so is fine. Like quick and done like is you're, fine. you're talking about priming, like really just kind of getting the brain yeah. sort of ready uh, for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, give some but, give us some other strategies about uh, you know some kind of quick kind of blanket strategies about things that couples can can do in a very kind of practical level to to increase uh, um, either the quality of their sex or the frequency of their sex. Right. So, well, let me share a couple of quotes about this idea of planning. Please. So. Um, So Esther Perel, who's done like these great TED talks and a bunch of other stuff, and she talks about um, sex and love, infidelity, all this stuff, um, has this great quote where she said in one of her videos that committed sex is premeditated sex. That, you know, you prepare ahead of time um, in a committed relationship. By the way, when you're single, you also prepare ahead of time because when you're going out on the town, even if you spontaneously hook up with someone, you know, you don't show up in your dirty underwear and, you know, like a T-shirt with holes in it. You know, like people don't generally have like spontaneous sex under those circumstances. Like they prepare ahead and they go to some places and they don't go to other places. So we plan ahead even then. Um, So. That's one great quote. I think, you know, another one is Marty Klein, who's another great writer on sexuality, um, you know, talks about kind of this myth that sex should just be spontaneous and natural. And he's in this case, he's talking about committed partners who've been together for a while, even though nothing else in your relationship is spontaneous and natural. <laughs> you know, like, it is kind of absurd when you think about it. Yeah, like you're an adult. Like that's not how, like when you're in college, that's what happens. You walk down the hall and you bump into someone and I don't know, you start drinking and then you, you get laid or something. You know, like that happens in college, maybe. I wish it happened more to me, but, um, but like that doesn't, when, that doesn't happen when you're 40. You know, like you have a mortgage and jobs and kids, like, you have real responsibilities. There's nothing in your life that happens like that. So this idea that sex should just kind of like happen is kind of ridiculous. Like the people who think sex should just happen, it doesn't happen for them. It's kind of like, how's that working for you? Right, exactly. So, um, so yeah, so I think it's a matter of really kind of committing to your relationship and committing to your sex life in that, you know, 
sort of there's this quote that you know your priorities are what are not what you say they are what you do Mm -hmm. so you can say it's you know my relationship is really important to me and i you know i want us to have a good relationship and lots of sex and whatever but then you don't take the time to do those things that make stuff better in the relationship so you know to really kind of make that commitment and that you know i think you know like i said before that you know that good behavior leads to good sex and also that good sex leads to good behavior that you know these are intimately connected in that if you're struggling already in your day-to-day stuff you don't need one more thing to struggle with in terms of like unhappy about your sex life and you are that much you know you're going to benefit that much more from that positive connection that comes from having good sexual experiences and also hopefully lots of other good experiences, fun, playful stuff that's not just about, you know, the business of the family, of getting kids off to the school bus, loading the dishwasher, filing the tax returns. You know, like, I think it's too easy for lots of couples, all couples to sort of neglect that fun, you know, doing some things that are different and not just like you said, kind of surviving the day. I mean, that, just the notion of, of self-care is, I mean, it, it's been a theme that's been kind of reemerging uh, uh, quite a bit lately, both for myself and just in my, in my coaching groups that like, you know, we all want to be kind of more productive in our, in our lives. And the things that really maximize our productivity the most have nothing to directly do with productivity maximizing strategies. It's all about your, you know, taking care of yourself, getting enough sleep, getting enough exercise, um, and getting enough play. I think play is so yeah. important, and, and sex falls into that category. Absolutely, sex is absolutely it's grown up play, um, and I think that yeah, it's self. You know, that's one of the places that I think self care. And just generally managing the the busyness of life, like that's where folks with ADHD struggle the most. And that's where these couples, these mixed couples struggle the most, you know, just taking care of that basic stuff. So it doesn't feel like you have time for the luxury of going out on a date or going and doing a fun thing because, you know, we got all this stuff we got to catch up on. And I totally get it because my life is as busy as anybody's. But but it's still important. It's at least it's worth aspiring to, even if we don't always hit the bullseye, but to kind of like, if you keep, if you've been missing for a while to, to keep taking shots at it, keep trying to make it happen. Um, and to not get sort of bitter and resentful and hopeless. Cause I think then you're really kind of lost as a couple. Mm. So uh, I am watching the clock and I know we just have a couple of minutes uh, left here. So if anyone has a, a question uh, who is in the chat room, uh, said now would be your last chance to uh, to ask that question. Um, Ari, I'm wondering if there's any kind of final thoughts that you have. Um, I'd also like you to share kind of where people can learn more about what you're doing, uh, your contact information. Um, so yeah, give us uh, where people can reach you and uh, let us know of any other uh, things you have coming up that we could be looking for on this topic. Sure. So um, best place to find out about me is my website, adultadhdbook.com. And of course, the word adult has taken on a whole new meaning now that I'm doing sex stuff, um, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, (laughs) How does your wife, as you've been doing more and more of this, how how does your wife think about what you're doing? I think she has mixed feelings. (laughs) I think, you know, obviously she's she's glad that I'm excited about it. Um, she finds it very interesting as well and probably sometimes wished I talked less about it or something. I don't know. Um, it's my is that, brand. Is that like what the topic of like during Thanksgiving dinner at the Tuckman family? Um, was that what you guys talked about? Yeah, actually we didn't, but we had a small Thanksgiving. It was me, my wife, my eight-year-old son and my mom. So yeah, th- this, this wasn't a topic of discussion. That would have been awkward. That would, yeah, that would have been awesome. So I do have some limits. Um, so, um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Like, I think in general, like this is, this is some of the stuff I'm doing. I mean, obviously I'm doing lots of other stuff in the world of ADHD and otherwise, but this is really kind of like my big thing these days. And so I'm, I'll continue to be presenting on it. I'm continuing to analyze the data. There's, you know, 
72 questions, 3,000 respondents. There's like 210,000 data points. So there's still more to tease out of there, and I'll be you know doing that. But for any of the listeners, if they still want to take the survey, which you can, it's um, ADHDRelationshipSexSurvey.com. And my hope is that the people who take it find, obviously, I get the benefit of that data. But, but my hope is that for you, that it kind of, it asks some good questions. It helps you sort of realize some things that maybe you didn't realize before. It puts some things in perspective. And that helps you then, um, you know, find out a little bit more about yourself and your partner and your relationship. All right. I want to thank you again for, uh, for coming back on the, the, the show for the third time and for, um, you know, being part of, of the ADHD rewired community and helping all of us get our ADHD rewired. My pleasure. It's always thank good to you, see you again. You. Thank you for listening to another episode of ADHD Rewired. And if you're new to the show, welcome to ADHD Rewired. We are more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. You can see a full outline of this and all other episodes with all the links and other resources mentioned during this interview at ADHDrewired.com. Help support this podcast by checking out my sponsors. I use Zoom video conferencing nearly every day, and so can you. Go free or go pro. But please, go to erictibbers.com slash Zoom so they know that I sent you. And you can get a free audiobook from Audible at erictibbers.com slash Audible. And next time you shop Amazon, use the Amazon search portal at ADHDrewired.com. A small percentage of your purchase will go to support this show. And it doesn't cost you anything extra. You can also support this podcast by leaving an honest rating and review in iTunes or Stitcher. This really helps other people find this show. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. Don't just be a passive listener, be an active member of the ADHD Rewired community. We are on Facebook. You can like our page, but please submit your request to join our free and growing community. And don't forget to check your other inbox because I screen everybody before they come into our community. Looking for a coach? If you're still listening at this point and you answered yes, come to my website at ADHDrewired.com and schedule your free 20-minute consultation or call me at 224-993-9450. Is your school, business, or organization hiring speakers? I provide fun and engaging presentations full of practical solutions that both educate and entertain. Hire me for your next professional development day or corporate training event. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash talks. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.